Well, tonight's uh, lecture is entitled The American Elite and the Origins of the CIA. Uh, that's actually the subtitle of one of the major sources. A great book, extremely rare. This book came out five years ago, and uh, like any book which connects our intelligence system with the uh, corporations which spawned it, uh, it did not get reviewed by the New York Times, and uh, the author has passed into obscurity. Uh, that's, that's something that you can be sure will happen. If you, uh, you can write about the intelligence community, or you can write about fascism, or you can write about corporations, but when you start putting those things together, Forget it. You not only will not get reviewed by the New York Times, but you will be professionally ostracized and uh, maybe worse than that. We should, uh, by way of introduction, mention that when most people think about U.S. intelligence, they think CIA. The CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency, only gets 15 percent of the intelligence budget. And that's something that's very important to remember because there's also the National Security Agency, the Defense Intelligence Agency, the Office of Naval Intelligence, the Office of uh, Special Investigations, OSI, which is Air Force Intelligence, and plenty of others. There's a lot of people, the Army Security Agency, most people have never heard of it. Extremely powerful institution. But most people, when they think of U.S. intelligence, they think of CIA. And when most people think of CIA, they, they tend to equate that with U.S. intelligence. So it's important to understand that we're only talking about one, uh, albeit very powerful, elite civilian intelligence agency, and there are many others. Uh, it's also worth understanding that the connections that I'm talking about and will be talking about uh, also had a lot to do with developing the national security state as a whole. And I'm going to attempt at the end of the lecture or during the latter part of the lecture to uh, show how some of the names that I will be relating, some of the institutions and some of the individuals, uh, also bore on the subsequent development of the Cold War and of the national security state. We're going to be talking about the genesis of the National Security Act of 1947, which created the CIA. We're going to be talking about uh, the, the same act which created the National Security Council and uh, things of that kind. Uh, but it, it's fascinating to examine the very small number of names that uh, crop up in a prominent way in connection with the development of our intelligence system and the CIA in particular. I'm going to mention a few of these names. I will, as is my custom, repeat these throughout the course of the lecture. Uh, this is not because I'm stuck in a rut, but rather, first of all, I'm long-winded, as anybody knows. Uh, and when you're dealing with a fairly lengthy or large body of information, the things that people tend to remember are what they hear first, what they hear last, and what gets repeated. It's one of the reasons why I repeat things in broadcasts and lectures. Some of the people who subscribe to the tapes and hear the, the program, hear One Step Beyond via tape, get really ticked off and saying, repeat yourself too much. Well, you know, the, the program does get taped, but there's a reason for that. Is people, I want people to remember certain names, and you tend to remember what gets repeated. Uh, so I will be repeating some of these names, but let me mention a few of the institutions and individuals that you're going to be hearing about. There are some major Wall Street law firms that figure prominently, pivotally, not only in the development of the CIA, but the U.S. national security state, and indeed they, have a, they wield a profound role in the history of the 20th century. Uh, first of all, two major Wall Street law firms, one is Sullivan and Cromwell, with its two major partners, Allen and John Foster Dulles major names, and you're going to be hearing a lot about those two uh, charming individuals. Also, another uh, major Wall Street law firm, Carter, Ledyard, and Milburn. That's another major Wall Street law firm not as well known as Sullivan and Cromwell. Uh, looking ahead to one of the things we're going to be talking about in the lecture, to give you an idea of the tremendous power wielded by what is a very small group of people, uh, when President Eisenhower was elected in 1952, he appointed John Foster Dulles, one of the major partners with Sullivan and Cromwell, uh, to be Secretary of State, and his brother, Alan Dulles, who was also a major partner in Sullivan and Cromwell, to be Director of Central Intelligence. At this same period in time, there were two Deputy Directors of Central Intelligence, one Frank Wisner, that's another of the names you want to remember, W-I-S-N-E-R, and also a guy named Harding Jackson, the full name actually William Harding Jackson, both of whom were deputy directors of Central Intelligence, and both of whom were also partners in Carter, Ledyard, and Milburn. So here you have two Wall Street law firms. Between them, they have the Secretary of State, the Director of Central Intelligence, and two deputy directors of Central Intelligence at the same time. When you talk about a concentration of power, just imagine... 
uh, the kind of influence that that gave those two institutions. And indeed, the corporate power that was exercised through many of these Wall Street law firms and the political and national security power that was wielded through the Central Intelligence Agency are inextricably linked. Uh, another name to remember is the Stinnis family. This is a, a German family which also had an American branch, and uh, they wielded profound influence on both sides of the Atlantic. The Stinnis concern was one of the uh, major elements in what uh, I shall refer to and what I have referred to in past talks as a transatlantic financial and industrial axis. This transatlantic financial and industrial axis uh, is deeply involved with the uh, names that I'm going to be speaking about this evening. Those names are part and parcel to this transatlantic financial and industrial axis. And this axis, in turn, is inextricably linked with the history of, function of, and development of fascism in the 20th century. So really, I could have entitled this lecture, Fascism, the American Elite, and the Origins of the CIA. That probably would have been a more accurate title or a more complete title. Another of the names to remember is the name Dylan Reed and Company. That's a major Wall Street investment firm, and uh, as is the case with uh, institutions like Carter Ledyard and Milburn or Sullivan and Cromwell, Dylan Reed wields a profound influence uh, in uh, the story that we're going to be hearing this evening. Uh, Dylan Reed was one of the major invest Wall Street investment firms that floated the uh, German securities, the German corporate securities, which built up German industry in the 1920s, and which in turn uh, led to not only a concentration of economic power in Germany, but those same institutions backed Adolf Hitler and later uh, provided the backbone of uh, German wartime industry. Uh, two other uh, officers with, uh, well, one of the major officers with Dillon and Reed, uh, a fellow named William Draper, who uh, became a brigadier general uh, largely as a result of his reservist connections, was the main official in charge, at least for a period of time, with uh, the alleged decartalization of Germany, which is a classic case of appointing the fox to uh, mind the chickens, because Dillon Reed was one of the major firms involved with the capitalization of these giant German cartels. So appointing someone like William Draper, an officer with Dylan Reed, uh, could not but have frustrated the decartalization. Again, that's appointing uh, not only a fox, but a very hungry fox to uh, guard the hen house. And if you wind up with a depletion of your chicken inventory under the circumstances, it shouldn't be all that surprising. Another uh, interesting name coming out of uh, Dylan Reed, and if, if, this, uh, if some of what I am saying appears exaggerated or far-fetched, Contemplate the actual formation of the national security state, and we're going to go into this later. Uh, James Forrestal, the Secretary of the Navy, who had much to do with drawing up the National Security Act, which brought the CIA and the National Security Council into being, an officer with Dylan Reed. Paul Nietzsche, who drew up NSC 68, if you heard RFA 37, NSC 68 was a memorandum which pretty much sets forth the uh, blueprint for U.S. Uh, operations during the Cold War also an officer with Dylan Reed. So it's really remarkable to see how, what a small number of institutions figures uh, in the course of this discussion. Another important point to make, too, is that uh, when somebody, and I, I mentioned this at the beginning of the talk when I was schmoozing away, when you mention uh, the term conspiracy or conspiracy theory, now it's a loaded term and it brings up uh, uh, connotations in most people's minds of a bunch of acid casualties sitting around with propeller beanies and two-way wrist radios watching Get Smart reruns on their VCRs. Uh, when you talk about conspiracy theory, people say, eh, well, I don't believe in conspiracy theories. And uh, all kinds of people who aren't qualified to comment intelligently will proceed to comment, albeit very unintelligently, and say, oh, I don't believe in conspiracies. But on the other hand, if you try a different word, try networking, and you try that on people, which is really a more accurate term, because what we're going to see is networking in a very, very big way. Another of the institutions to remember, by the way, is the BIS. That's the Bank for International Settlements in Switzerland. If you talk about networking, however, pe that's something people can relate to a lot more readily. They networking, they think, well, you know, you know, networking, yeah, well, you mean, oh, like what yuppies do. You mean like what I do. Oh, why, well, yes, how nice. And indeed, networking is really what we're looking at, because what we're going to be looking at is an old boy network uh, and a relatively small number of individuals and institutions who have wielded a profound influence on the course of this country's history. It's also interesting to contemplate the specific nature of the Central Intelligence Agency and uh, the fact that in many ways the CIA and its predecessor and parent institution, the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, and its parent institution too, the Office of uh, the Coordinator of Information, which was actually our first World War II intelligence agency. The, I've seen it as both OCI and COI. 
Uh, that was that ex existed for a total of 11 months, and then it was replaced by the OSS. Uh, it's also worth noting that uh, we're going to be talking and a couple of other names to remember too. Remember the Morgan Industrial and Financial Group because that figures prominently in the narrative as well. Uh, networking is really what we're looking at, and it's interesting to contemplate the fact that the CIA as an institution not only grew up out of Wall Street uh, comings and goings, but specifically was hatched, and uh, that is the right term, by Wall Street corporate lawyers. And in many ways, the nature of the Central Intelligence Agency as an institution derives, I think, uh, directly, at least to a certain extent, from the way corporate lawyers work. And what I'm going to do by way of formally kicking off the lecture is to read a short passage from this remarkable and long out of uh, print book. And again, one of the major sources that I utilized for this lecture and whose subtitle uh, I adopted for the lecture. The book is called The Old Boys. It's by Burton Hirsch, last name H-E-R-S-H, -E uh, not to be confused with the cheap whore uh, Cy Hirsch, who just uh, issued this book on uh, uh, the, uh, the alleged, alleged book on the Kennedy, assass uh, Kennedy uh, administration, probably uh, a product of the Wurlitzer, by the way, the CIA's media component. Uh, this is a great, great book, and it... Uh, was not, I guess it must have had a small printing, but it went out of, out of print very quickly and is now all but impossible to find. And in this book, Burton Hirsch discusses the nature of the CIA and the MO, so to speak, the modus operandi of corporate law. And I think this is a very, very uh, important uh, point to understand because uh, the ways in which the CIA has operated are not necessarily characteristic of most intelligence agencies. Indeed, the CIA in its inception uh, ideally was supposed to be an intelligence gathering and coordinating uh, institution, which is the general uh, purpose of an intelligence agency, is the gathering and collation and analysis of information. However, the CIA in many ways has become uh, what would be more properly termed a combatant secret service. When we think of the CIA and we think of covert operations, that is actually atypical of the way intelligence agencies have operated in the past. In the 20th century, covert operations have tended to become something of a uh, way of life, or it's become relatively familiar to many of us, uh, yet uh, it's important to understand that that is not the traditional function of an intelligence agency. An intelligence agency traditionally is to gather, collate, and analyze information so that one's economic and military components can then act uh, intelligently and effectively on that information. The world of covert operations, plausible deniability, the things that most Americans and probably people around the world as well have come to associate with a central intelligence agency are not traditionally a function of a pure intelligence agency. However, in many ways, the characteristics of the CIA could be said, and I think Burton, the point that I'm about to read via Burton, Burton Hirsch is absolutely on the money, they could be said to derive from the way a corporate lawyer operates. <clears throat> Uh, talking about uh, 1941, 1941 was the year that Henry Luce uh, dubbed the 20th century the American century, so that's the reference here. The same year Henry Luce laid claim to the 1900s, an extraordinarily nimble New York antitrust attorney named William J. Wild Bill Donovan inveigled Franklin Roosevelt into underwriting the first encompassing intelligence instrumentality, the Office of the Coordinator of Information. Donovan's profession was relevant. Donovan, by the way, was a major Wall Street lawyer, uh, and we're going to talk about a mission that uh, he was uh, dispatched on by J.P. Morgan in 1920. The commission that he got from J.P. Morgan was what he used to uh, found his Wall Street law firm. But uh, William J. Wild Bill Donovan, the head of the OSS, is one of these uh, major players. Donovan's profession was relevant, and it is equally no accident that all three load-bearing protagonists throughout this work Bill Donovan, Alan Dulles, and Frank Wisner achieved status in America by way of important Wall Street law partnerships. In many ways, a trusted corporate attorney accomplishes substantially for his clients what today's one-stop national intelligence factory goes after for its patron. He puts the deals together. He damps down crises and flaps. He keeps the process as confidential as possible. He finds out everything he can and resorts to every means imaginable to shape the outcome. He proceeds by the case system and preferably one emergency at a time. The next passage is really important. Furthermore, an intelligence service concocted by lawyers 
men accustomed not merely to spotting the problems, but also to defining them to their clients and recommending appropriate action, is far more likely than a traditional military intelligence staff to reach in and condition policy, i.e. covert operations. Attorneys have a seductive way of subordinating, of subordinating their clients, of insinuating their ledger domain until they become the movers. And thus, it develops that in many strategic entanglements, the lawyers have at least as much control over the outcome as elected officials. And I think that's a very, very important point that Burton Hirsch is making, because in many ways, the nature of the CIA as an institution, its connections with the American elite, the Wall Street elite in particular, derive, its peculiarities derive from the fact that not only lawyers, but corporate lawyers, wielded a profound influence in the genesis, not only of the CIA, but as we're going to see, the evolution of the 20th century, the evolution of fascism, and the evolution of the national security state in the post-World War II period, of which, obviously, the CIA was an important part. Now, bear in mind some of the names that I've already mentioned. The law firms of Carter, Ledyard, and Milburn, the law firms of Sullivan and Cromwell, William J. Wild, Bill Donovan, the Morgan Financial and Industrial Group. Uh, bear in mind the Stinnis firm. You're going to be hearing the name Stinnis in a lot of different uh, contexts. That name, is, by the way, is capital S-T-I-N-N-E-S. -N -N -E uh, a family and a, uh, an industrial concern with, as I like to say, more connections and a switchboard. Remember the Bank for International Settlements, or B-I-S. Uh, that those are some of the names. You see, by the way, for the for people who might have thought that I was uh, flapping my gums, sure enough, uh, as soon as I started the lecture, we've just had five new arrivals. You know, so that uh, the uh, the teriyaki steak and shrimp law holds uh, holds steady here as far as this particular lawyer. Thanks for coming, but I just was commenting. Uh, a bit of an ad lib. I said, well, if we start the lecture, there's a sure way to guarantee that we'll have some more arrivals is to start the lecture now, and I'll guarantee you we'll get some more people coming uh, after the lecture begins. But uh, by the way, the lecture is being taped, and so you'll have a chance to recoup. I, I schmoozed for quite a while to give people a chance to uh, to arrive, and uh, let's just say I, I did the best I could. So if I couldn't stave off the firing squad, uh, at the very least, I got you a couple of extra smokes before the triggers got pulled. So uh, we're, we're in business here. But remember some of these names, and as I relate, the, I'm going to be... Uh, <laughs> It's going to seem a little pretentious, but I'm going to relate as best I can some of the major developments of the history of the 20th century. And it's amazing to see what a relatively small number of individuals and institutions have wielded an incalculably great influence, uh, not only over the century, but over the lives of uh, the people who have lived in it, including uh, thee and me. Going to, oh, by the way, there's another aspect of uh, lawyers in the, that, that relates to the CIA. Another aspect of uh, attorneys is that uh, they represent their clients, and generally speaking, uh, after the case is over, the client is stuck with the results of the case, and the lawyer collects his fee and walks on. That is not unlike the way the CIA has operated in many countries. Now, again, for the benefit of people who just arrived, when you're talking about the CIA, one should not make the mistake of confusing the CIA with the U.S. intelligence apparatus as a whole, because it only gets 15% of the intelligence budget. But when you have something like, for example, the 1954 coup in Guatemala, in which Jacobo Arbenz was overthrown by the CIA, uh, that was something which had a disastrous effect on Guatemala. I mean, it just, it, it, that was when the death squads and the horrible bloodletting that has obtained in Guatemala since then began. And yet the uh, corporate lawyers who set that up, Alan Dulles from Sal Sullivan and Cromwell, his brother, of course, John Foster Dulles from Sullivan and Cromwell, who was Secretary of State when Alan was... Uh, a, uh, w was director of Central Intelligence. Bear in mind that Harding Jackson and Frank Wisner, two partners in Carter, Ledyard, and Milburn, were deputy directors of Central Intelligence at this same time. Uh, they basically knocked off Jacobo Arbenz. The public was told, using the mighty Wurlitzer, the CIA's media component, public was told that Arbenz was a communist and that he was a dangerous influence in the hemisphere and he had to be disposed of. Nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, Jacobo Arbenz was a social reformer, and uh, Guatemala in the early 50s was a feudal society. And what Arbenz was looking to do was to transform Guatemala from a feudal economy and a feudal society into a modern market-oriented economy uh, based on a uh, small North American republic called the United States of America. Some, some of you may have heard of it. Uh, obviously, I'm being facetious here, but this is the point, is that Arbenz was not only not a communist, far from it. He wanted to transform this backward feudal society into a modern 
market-oriented economy based, specifically patterned on the United States. But to do so, he was going to appropriate some 150, I can't remember it was 150,000 square miles or 150,000 acres, I believe it was square miles, of prime agricultural land that was owned by the United Fruit Company, uh, much of whose law work was handled by Sullivan and Cromwell, and uh, whose operations were inextricably linked with the very Wall Street elite that uh, I've been talking about. So they basically tarred Jacobo Arbenz with the Kami brush, knocked him out of uh, power, and then uh, Guatemala was devastated after that. However, United Fruit, Alan Dulles, uh, the uh, Carter Ledyard and Milburn partners, Jackson and Wisner, went on their way. Basically, uh, the client went to the chair, and the lawyers collected their fee and walked. This, too, is uh, not, uh, not unrelated, in my opinion. Uh, th this paradigm is not unrelated to the CIA as, to a certain extent, at least an outgrowth of corporate law. Uh, another aspect to the CIA is that uh, that institution, I'm specifically talking about the CIA as opposed to other intelligence services and other U.S. intelligence services, it tends to be very self-referential. It uh, tends to read its own press, so to speak, and uh, to not be all that connected, uh, at least in my opinion, obviously I'm expressing an opinion here, with the actual realities that it's dealing with, because it, in my opinion, uh, derives to a large extent its character from Wall Street law, uh, it really is not all that connected with the realities of the countries in which it operates. Uh, just as Wall Street, to a considerable extent, is isolated, and Wall Street lawyers, Wall Street corporate lawyers, are isolated from uh, Mr. and Mrs. America and all the ships at sea, so to speak. Uh, when the, the market goes in the tank or when there's a major development on Wall Street, uh, the stockbrokers and the Wall Street lawyers and the CEOs and the board of directors are not necessarily in contact with or particularly uh, concerned with the average American man and woman and what happens to them. They basically, a lot of them could give a squat. And uh, the uh, old saying that what's good for General Motors is good for America does not necessarily apply. But I think to a certain extent, the insular and self-referential quality of the CIA also derives from its genesis from and connections to major co uh, corporate Wall Street lawyers. Now, what I'm going to do, attempt to do is to, and this will maybe be overly ambitious, maybe a little pretentious, but uh, then that would be the first time I would have been called either of those two things, but uh, an attempt to run down some of the major developments in the 20th century and to give a thumbnail sketch of not only the development of fascism, but also to try to tie in some of these names in some of the major developments of and some of the major uh, connections that uh, have helped to shape our century. We're going to begin with the ending of World War I, because that's really where our story begins. Uh, but this feels really corny. Our story begins at the end of World War I. You know, Woodrow Wilson, the Princeton educator president of the United States. <laughs> it's, uh, it's actually interesting, too, uh, to see the role played by the Ivy League and graduates of the Ivy League. Ivy League is a, a very elite group of colleges in the Northeast, uh, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Columbia, the University of Pennsylvania, Dartmouth, uh, Brown. Did I say Columbia? Yeah, I think that pretty much covers it. Um, and the Ivy League and the uh, Eastern establishment in general wield through, uh, wind throughout this particular story, and the uh, degree of influence they wield is incalculable. Uh, it's also interesting to note, too, that uh, in uh, the late 1990s, as the right wing gains strength, we're seeing a lot now about the, uh, the, the Jewish banking conspiracy and the protocols of the elders of Zion and that the, uh, sort of doctrinaire anti-Semitism uh, that has... Uh, been extant in, the, in the, the corridors of power in this century is now beginning, beginning to resurface in the United States. It never went away, but it is now beginning to uh, come back, and we're hearing about you know the Jewish bankers who run Wall Street. There are Jewish bankers on Wall Street, of course, and the Jews who run Hollywood and this, that, and the other thing. Very few people actually know what ethnic group, we, it's actually a religious group, but it also has an ethnic uh, connotation, what ethnic group really does wield power in this country. Now, there's also a lot of powerful Catholic money. Uh, the German capital and the Bormann organization now wield quite a bit of influence. But there is one particular ethnic group that dominates the American elite and the American, quote, ruling class, unquote. That's a term I hate. Is there anybody in the audience who can name that group? And it, don't, don't feel in any way embarrassed if you can't, because one of the things powerful people have learned is to keep their name out of the papers, and they don't advertise. And there's one group. I'll give you a real big hint. George Bush is a member of this group. In fact, if you wanted to epitomize the American ruling class and the American power elite, as C. Wright Mills called it, George Bush exemplifies it. 
Anglo-Saxon is actually the nationality from which they come, but the group is the Episcopalians. It's actually the American branch of the old Anglican church, and there's a, there's a remarkable book out called The Power of Their Glory. I think I lost my copy, or else my copy was ripped off and moving or something. But it is amazing the extent to which the American power structure is Episcopalian. Yet you don't hear about it. You hear about you know, the Jews this and the Jews that and the Masons this, and hearing all this hocus-pocus about the Illuminati now. But you never hear about those Episcopalians, boy, those, those damned Episcopalians. You know, they're, they're doing it again, you know. And yet, the American elite is Episcopalian. There have also been X number of Presbyterians and other Protestant sects. But it's amazing. That for, to give an example of the, how powerful the Episcopalian church is and the extent to which they overlap the American elite and the people we're talking about, uh, when Dwight Eisenhower, in between the time Dwight Eisenhower was commander of uh, the uh, European forces or allied forces in Europe, and the time he was elected president, he was president of Columbia University, a member of the Ivy League. And he was, I think he was Lutheran or maybe Presbyterian. He was mixed uh, German and Swedish extraction, a five-star general in the U.S. Army and an international hero as well as a national hero. And yet he was not an Episcopalian. And before he could be approved as uh, president of Columbia University, there was a special meeting of the Board of Trustees of Columbia University to see if it was permissible to have a non-Episcopalian as president of this elite institution. And that is how powerful and how ingrown they are. They are very powerful. Powerful and very ingrown, and yet you don't hear about them. George Bush is Episcopalian, and he also hails from a Wall Street uh, family, and also his, fa his family was inextricably linked with not only the development of international fascism, but also uh, the uh, Central Intelligence Agency as well, for which in all likelihood George Bush has uh, worked from the moment of his graduation from Yale University, another member of the Ivy League. There's a good book, by the way, if you want to hunt it down. A gentleman asked me about books earlier to uh, give you an idea of the uh, bleed over, and that's probably a good term, between the CIA and the intelligence community and the groves of academe, the uh, elite institutions in the Ivy League in particular. It's a book called Cloak and Gown by Robin Winks, W-I-N-K-S, just like winking your eye, who, by the way, uh, is a faculty member at Yale University, one of the most powerful CIA-connected firms. But the uh, Ivy League and the American elite, the Episcopalian elite, is something that uh, the influence of which on the, the narrative that I'm about to try to set forth here could not be exaggerated. It's also worth noting that before we actually had a formal civilian intelligence agency, uh, many of our presidents, uh, Woodrow Wilson in particular, had put together informal intelligence advisory groups. For example, as World War I was drawing to a close, and that's the period of time that we're looking at right now, Woodrow Wilson relied in considerable measure for advice on what was basically a def kind of de facto intelligence service analysis group or think tank called the Inquiry. That's what is its nickname. It was at Columbia University, comprised of elite uh, Ivy Leaguers, largely Episcopalian, and these people, you know, this, this little Ivy League group, uh, wielded a profound influence over U.S. national policy. It's worth understanding that in World War I, tremendous changes were uh, effected in the world. Not only technological changes, it saw the first uh, military use, widespread military use of things like the submarine and the airplane, which were to shape the uh, course of 20th century military operations. It also saw the dissolution of the three huge monarchies that had dominated Europe, the Hohenzollerns, the Romanovs, and the Habsburgs, all dissolved. The Hohenzollern, uh, Romanov, and Habsburg empires dissolved. Uh, the nations of Yugoslavia and Czechoslovakia were formed at the end of World War I out of uh, some of these empires. <laughs> now, uh, as the century draws to a close, Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia have now been unformed thanks to the uh, activities of Germany and the acquiescence of the United States. But it's worth understanding that tremendous changes were uh, wielded, were effected in the world in World War I. Not only were these monarchies dissolved, but the world's first Marxist state, the Soviet Union, came into being. And the effect that this had uh, on uh, the elites, not only in this country, but around the world, could not be exaggerated. It had much to do with shaping the course of world power politics. It's also worth understanding that there were a bunch of uh, unsuccessful, or in some cases short-lived Marxist revolutions in other countries as well. Hungary, for a period of time, was uh, under a Marxist-dominated uh, government uh, headed by a fellow named Bela Kuhn. Uh, there were abortive, uh, and I'm not sure about the pronunciation on that. I've read it many times. It's one of those names you don't hear a lot. You know, oh, yeah, Bela Kuhn, you know, right. Him and, him and the Episcopalians, you know. But it, uh, it, it's, uh, he, he, for a time, was in charge in Hungary before he was dispatched by militia bullets. And it's worth noting 
that uh, the, there were abortive Marxist revolutions in other countries as well, Germany in particular. It's also worth noting that uh, as the treaty, as, as the Versailles Conference convened, the two main items on the agenda were uh, basically not only how to contain already the fledgling USSR, but what to do with Germany. And these two questions were already being linked in the mind of the old boys, as we might uh, term them. In the first place, uh, again, Germany experienced a series of abortive uh, Marxist revolutions. They were put down by military and paramilitary groups. It is in this exact time period that we see the genesis of Adolf Hitler. Uh, to make a very long story very short, in order to combat these Marxist revolutions, uh, Weimar uh, Germany put together a series, put together some paramilitary organizations composed of uh, World War I veterans and also right-wing students. One of them was called the Fry Corps or Free Corps, the Ein Vornivaren and the Zeit Freiwilligenverband. These organizations basically crushed the Marxist revolutions in various places, uh, such as Bavaria and Munich. And it was in this uh, exact period in which Adolf Hitler had his genesis as well. Adolf Hitler was an undercover agent for the political department of the Reichswehr, the German army. Uh, his initial assignment as an undercover agent was to be infiltrated into the Marxist revolution in Munich. He infiltrated the revolution, par uh, basically passing himself off as one of the revolutionaries. Then when the, quote, white, unquote, troops, that's to contrast them with the Reds in, in the contemporary political parlance of the time, when the white troops recaptured the city, Adolf Hitler then broke cover and fingered all the leaders of the uh, revolution were then promptly taken out and shot. He was basically a stool pigeon. Uh, then his next undercover assignment was to infiltrate a moribund political party in Germany, the German Socialist Workers' Party, which he did, and uh, along with a number of other uh, Reichswehr and pan-German uh, agents. That uh, moribund political party was then renamed the German National Socialist Workers' Party, the uh, NSDAP, and it became in its inception, not later, but in its inception, it was a front for Reichswehr intelligence, for German army intelligence. And it was uh, utilized as a vehicle for uh, uh, introducing the supposedly demobilized German army into civilian society for the purposes of affecting political reaction and specifically to overthrow the Weimar Republic. There were a number of fascist parties in Germany at this time. Uh, my, in my opinion, the reason why Hitler came to power was because of the military intelligence connections of the NSDAP. There was, for example, the Stahlhelm or Steel Helmet and a number of other parties as well that were vying. They were sort of like in a horse race, we might think of, as to who was going to take power because everybody within the German power structure hated the Weimar Republic and it was only a matter of time before it got done in. It was a question of who was basically going to uh, going to assume the seat of power once President Ebert and the Weimar Republic were disposed of. It's worth noting that in this time period, 1919 we're talking about, the Catholic Church, or specifically the Vatican, was channeling church monies to Hitler through the papal nuncio to Munich. That was a fellow named Archbishop Eugenio Pacelli. He later became Cardinal Eugenio Pacelli, later and better known as Pope Pius XII. He was channeling church monies to Hitler as early as 1919, and in fact, uh, according to uh, one of uh, Pacelli's aides, a woman, a German nun named Pascalina Lehnert, uh, dubbed by Vatican wags La Popessa, because she was said to be the real pope, the power behind the throne, so to speak. Uh, after uh, Eugenio Pacelli, uh, then an archbishop, later Pope Pius XII, after he gave Hitler a bunch of Vatican money, he said, uh, go and uh, do, do thy works in the name of God Almighty. And Hitler said, in the name of God Almighty I shall. Which is interesting, considering that Hitler was the exponent of a pan-German occult philosophy which was explicitly uh, anti-Christian in its, uh, in its uh, outlook and in its uh, practices. But it's worth noting that at the, tr at the Versailles Treaty, in 1919, we're going to see many of, these, many of the elements and many of the players that we're talking about uh, already looking to not only uh, influence the world that was developing at that time, but also to advance their own careers. It's fascinating, too, to read the account of some of these major 20th century movers and shakers and to see uh, how they were... Uh, basically playing politics with an awful lot of people's lives in order to further their own careers. And they were, uh, many of them, although many of them were doctrinaire fascists, for example, a lot of them were careerists, and they were basically doing this in order to advance their own professional careers so they could go back to, you know, Princeton or Yale or Dartmouth or Columbia, you know, for their 50th reunion and have a, an impressive resume and a bunch of kids and so forth. Careerism is a very important element in uh, the narrative that uh, we're setting forth here. But in 1919... 
Uh, the Dulles brothers were very active in and around Versailles. Some of them were actually at Versailles attending the conference. Some of them were traveling around. It was during a trip to Berlin at this time that John Foster Dulles, again, one of the senior partners with Sullivan and Cromwell. That, well, that firm, Sullivan and Cromwell, is one of the major names to remember, as is John Foster Dulles. John Foster Dulles, in 1919, uh, hooked up with Yalmar Schacht. Yalmar Schock was a German investment banker. His full name was Yalmar Horace Greeley Schock. And if that doesn't sound particularly German, it's because he was named after the famous American journalist, Yalmar Horace Greeley Schock. He was the fellow uh, who was credited with taming the German runaway inflation. Uh, he then went on an international trip in 1931, assuring uh, the power elite in various corporations around Europe that uh, Hitler and the Nazis were not, quote, not as opposed to big business as has been generally assumed, which has to get something of a New World's indoor record for understatement under the circumstances. But it is in this very time period, and again, let me introduce this term here. When you talk about, well, it'll be a conspiracy theory, people say, yeah, I don't believe in conspiracies. You know, I don't believe in conspiracy theories. Networking, because that's exactly what we're looking at, and we're going to watch these networks develop, and eventually we're, we're going to watch them uh, blossom into many of the institutions which have become household words to the politically aware in the 20th century and which have dominated the lives of people in this and other countries. Now, one of the things, two of the dynamics that were going uh, on at this time, again, in 1919, already many of the uh, American elite who were attending the Versailles Conference, many of these powerful Wall Street lawyers, John Foster Dulles in particular, were already looking to rebuild German industry. This is 1919, to use it as a fulcrum for effecting anti-communism in Europe. They wanted to build up a strong Germany and to use uh, tradition German militarism and industrial power as a vehicle for guaranteeing uh, the anti-Bolshevik status of Europe. It's also worth noting that in this very time period, uh, the jockeying was taking place already to exclude the former, uh, the, the former Soviet Union from the family of nations. It's worth noting, and here's another name to remember, that uh, the U.S. ambassador to the court of uh, the Romanovs was a guy named DeWitt Pool. Now, he was an old Ivy Leaguer. He was a Princeton graduate, uh, a member for a while of the inquiry at Columbia University. He was one of the founders of the Columbia Journalism Review. Uh, he was the founder of uh, Public Opinion Quarterly. If you remember my lecture or my interview with Christopher Simpson and the author, the author of The Science of Coercion, Public Opinion Quarterly in the post-World War II period in many ways exemplified the marriage of American mass communication research and psychological warfare. He also was in charge of the Foreign Nationalities Branch of the OSS. But in 19 in 1918, he was the U.S. ambassador to Imperial Russia, and rather than, than maintain diplomatic relations with the Bolsheviks, he broke off diplomatic relations. He was an ardent anti-communist, and he then uh, attempted to uh, pass on, in most cases he didn't have to uh, work very hard, to pass on his sentiments to others at the Versailles Conference. Now, it's fascinating that Woodrow Wilson was not among those who uh, wanted to exclude the Soviet Union from the family of nations. On the contrary, it was Wilson's opinion that the best way for causing the moderation of Soviet policies, and in particular the attitudes of people like Lenin, was to incorporate the Soviet Union into the family of nations, basically. It's what uh, in uh, the latter part of the century has been termed constructive engagement on the part of uh, a number of different types of uh, international relations. But most of the American elite, most of the old boys, most of these powerful Wall Street lawyers who, as we're going to see, have uh, helped to shape the development of the American intelligence system, they were in favor of reading the Soviet Union out of international affairs. Wilson did not share this opinion. It's also worth noting in this time period, again, we're talking 1919, that another of the names we're going to hear, a guy named William Bullitt, B-U-L-L-I-T-T, -T, who again was an American uh, Ivy Leaguer, a member of the old Philadelphia Main Line. Another uh, thing you know, a lot of people don't know hear about is uh, uh, much of the American elite was on the Main Line. It was part of one of the uh, train lines out of Philadelphia, and the, Philadelphia is a profoundly important city in studying the origins of the American power structure, and uh, in particular the Wall Street and corporate elite who we're going to be talking about. Uh, William Bullitt was uh, from the Philadelphia Main Line Society. Uh, we we're talking about the uh, Morgan Financial and Industrial Group, another key member of Philadelphia Society, was a member of the Morgan Group, was Edward Stotesbury. He was a Morgan partner, a major financer of fascism. His daughter, Patricia Stotesbury, married an up-and-coming uh, military officer named Douglas MacArthur. That had much to do with Douglas MacArthur's rise to the general staff. 
Uh, it's also worth noting, too, uh, as we're setting the stage, as we're introducing uh, the dramatis personae, so to speak, for this particular uh, power play that we're talking about, uh, it's worth mentioning uh, a couple of officers who played a critical part in the Rainbow Division in World War I. Those officers were Douglas MacArthur and William J. Wild Bill Donovan. Wild Bill Donovan, again, a major corporate lawyer, one of the main names we're going to hear about, went on to become the head of the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services. He also was an officer with MacArthur in the Rainbow Division in World War I. They developed a bitter rivalry in this time period, and that rivalry... Uh, remained intact throughout uh, the, the, the period between the World Wars and then blossomed in World War II when uh, MacArthur became the most important military officer in the Pacific and uh, Donovan became head of the OSS, but they still hated each other's guts. So military intelligence in the Pacific and the OSS were frequently working at cross purposes. Uh, it's interesting and sad to contemplate how many GIs wound up under white crosses in Pacific cemeteries because of this rivalry while these two uh, pampered members of the American elite jockeyed for their professional resumes. And guy, you know, when you're a commander of an army group or a head of a major intelligence service, this is a very good time to lose one's professional ego, uh, because if you don't lose your professional ego, a lot of other people lose their lives. However, this, this uh, rivalry, and it was a bitter rivalry, dated to World War I, when uh, Donovan was commanding the Fighting 69th, or the Fighting Harps, as they were known. This was a largely Irish-American unit in World War I, part of the Rainbow Division, which, by the way, had the same sort of derivation as Jesse Jackson and the Rainbow Coalition. It was composed of a number of different ethnic groups, and one of those groups, the Green in the Rainbow, were, were the uh, Fighting 69th, or the Fighting Harps, a group of uh, New York Irish Americans. Uh, one of the members of that regiment, by the way, was the, the then relatively famous poet Joyce Kilmer, who was killed in World War I. Uh, MacArthur set a trap for some German troops. He basically was going to lure a, a critical uh, element of Ludendorff's uh, uh, troops into a trap. So what he did was he set Donovan and his regiment, the Fighting 69th, as the bait in the trap. And what they were to do was to engage the German troops and then fall back drawing the German troops after them so that the jaws of the trap could close around them. Well, Donovan disobeyed orders. Instead of falling back as he was ordered to do, he decided to hold his position. So he held his position. His unit got decimated. They got cut to pieces, and the trap failed because basically he didn't lure the troops in. From that time onward, Douglas MacArthur and Wild Bill Donovan hated each other's guts, and that rivalry had a lot to do with uh, some of the intelligence snafus in the Pacific Theater during the Second World War. Uh,